I don't know Liz Harris, save for the scant bits of information on Wikipedia, I have very little idea of who she is or what she's like in person. But I know Grouper, the hazy, folksy, dreamy drone project that captivated the indie world in 2008 with the album dragging a dead deal up a hill. An album that featured a collection of smudgy, reverberating folk songs that seemed to all at once entrance and envelop. The obvious statement to make for those of you who know Grouper or who have just googled that name is that Liz Harris is Grouper. And in the strictest sense of the term, that's correct. But there's a reason I'm distancing the two. Grouper is the stuff I hear in my head when nothing else is playing. It's the white noise that permeates my brain, the background music to almost every scene in my day-to-day -day life. It's always there, sometimes faint and sometimes loud and attention-grabbing. Because, as it turns out, almost everything Liz Harris sings about resonates with me deeply. But I don't know Miss Harris. I'm also quite sure she doesn't know who I am, and that's perfectly fine, because art and artist, while connected, are so undeniably separate. And yet the lyrical nods to self-exile and being alone all speak to me, and the seemingly shy approach she takes only seems to add to that. The lyrics are often found buried under sheets of reverb and fuzz, which is why for the first few months I started listening to her music, I kinda ignored them. The music alone was enough to connect to. And when I finally did start listening to what she was saying, that connection I felt to the music deepened. For as long as I can remember, I've always been an indoor person. I don't think there's any larger reasoning behind it other than the fact that I'm usually more comfortable in my room. Now, mind you, I'm by no means a hermit, not by any stretch of that word. I actually spend most of my time outside of my room, but mainly because I have to. And it's not like being outside is a torturous ordeal. I actually enjoy being around people, just not as much as I like being in my room. And I have to imagine that there's more than one of you who can relate to that feeling. It's what normal, healthy people would call introversion and what your asshole psychiatrist might call social anxiety. But people like me, we just call that life. Now, I'm by no means making a statement about Liz Harris, her way of life or her state of mind. I'm saying this. The music Liz Harris makes under the grouper name seems to capture a very specific feeling. A feeling that is almost unmistakably connected to aloneness and isolationism. Her music hasn't always been as accessible as dragging. Her earlier stuff, particularly that first release, are a little more esoteric less strummy and a lot more abrasive, lending more to noise music than anything else. But the one thing that has remained consistent through all of Harris's material is her voice. The human voice is, after all, the greatest of all instruments, or at least the most evocative. In Harris's case, it's enough to make even the driest, noisiest atmospheres feel soft and lush. I can't say that I like her earlier work as much as the latest stuff, because I generally don't. But there are things to appreciate even on the earlier stuff. There's the song Second Skin, Zombie Wind, with its distorted layers of noise and looped vocals that I enjoy in a different kind of way. It's a lot harder for me to emotionally connect to a lot of this music, but if you're into noise and occasionally listen to Merzbau or Sonic Youth, you might be into the self-titled. Dragging a Dead Deer Up a Hill was my first introduction to Grouper. As was the case with a lot of people, it's an easy album to like, especially if you're one who's into dream pop and folky atmosphere. And for a while it was just something I put on in the background when I needed to, I guess, relax or calm down. But like I said, when I finally started listening to the lyrics and what she was singing, 
this album really started making sense to me. There's one song in particular that really got to me. A cover over is the ninth song on Dragging. 31 minutes into the millionth listen through of this album, I actually had to stop and think long and hard about one very specific line. friends. But I also have a tendency to overthink everything. Spend enough time alone and at some point your brain begins to devour itself. It begins to break down every encounter you've ever had, every relationship, and everything anybody close to you has ever said about or to you. Then after it's taken a few big bites of your ego and imagination, it fills those crevices with something called speculation. That's when things get kind of difficult. Because I've had people who were pretty damn sure that they were my friend suddenly learn that I wasn't under the same impression, and vice versa. Because, as it turns out, unless I hear somebody say the words, Hey dude, we're friends, my brain assumes the worst. And leads to moments where I find myself thinking about friends and wondering if they too wonder who their friends are. And it's only when I heard somebody else say it that it really struck me. Suddenly I had a description, a tag with which I could label that little bit of neuroses. Stuff that Grouper does as well. For all I know, Liz Harris doesn't do any of that shit. Grouper could just be a character or an over-exaggeration or even a way to reason and explore concepts outside of herself. All I know is, it hit me, right in the chest. The rest of this album is pretty damn good as well. It's interesting listening to this after I've listened to the rest of her discography. This album feels so sparse in comparison to everything she's done, toned down and stripped back. It feels like a foray or detour into folk music which mainly pays off. I happen to think that this is the least consistent grouper album other than her debut. There are songs here that I really like, but there are also ones that I'm kind of indifferent towards. If I had to pick a favorite song from this album, it would be the song Fishing Bird. It's a song that I think really communicates grouper's fascination with nature which is a theme that flows throughout not only this album, but her discography as well. AIA is a double album released by Harris in 2011. These albums are decidedly different from the one that preceded them. In fact, these albums have more in common with her debut record than they do with Dragging. They're dense, heavy, fuzzed out, and distant. The reverb is cavernous and Harris's voice is, most of the time, buried beneath layers of sound. She's a monk, bellowing from the inside of a dark cave. There's no discernible strumming on this album, and any semblance of conventional song structure is thrown right out the window. There is only sound, noise, sheets of distorted synth tones and dusty piano notes. And, as usual, the recurring feature, the thing that ties this album to the last, is her voice. Dragging a Dead Deer is still considered a quintessential dream pop release by many. AIA, less so. This may not be what the indie kids wanted, but it's the one I prefer. The first of the two, Dream Loss, is achingly beautiful. Stained with melancholy and suspended in an equally emotional air, Harris haunts this record. Her voice is spectral, obscured most of the time, and yet it still manages to be the focal point of this release. Her voice is the anchor that holds you in place while you drift through this music, 
and Drifty is an apt comparison here because I can almost guarantee that the first few times you listen to this, it will be nearly impossible to tell where one song ends and the other begins. Interestingly, the first song seems to either, intentionally or not, call back to the previous album. But dragging the streets is different from dragging a dead deer in almost every way that counts. My personal grievance with dragging a dead deer was the inconsistency, especially from one song to another. AIA doesn't have that issue. In fact, it swings hard in the other direction. Harris delivers an experience, a journey. This is music that lends itself to meditation. I find it a lot easier to describe this album in abstract terms. Concrete notions would simply not do it justice. This is music that is intentionally vague and smudgy. Tones and motifs bleed into one another. You get the sense that there's movement, but it's uneven and gradual, lurching from one song to another. And because of that lack of clarity, I often end up remembering songs according to motifs. Soul Eraser has that one bass riff, or a tone has that repeating vocal line, etc. A Lie, the closer, is the only track that has a recognizable structure. But even here though, I use that term loosely. The music is toned down, unearthing the vocals. They're clearer, but still not clear, still very fuzzy, but still emotionally affecting. The second album, Alien Observer, is the more intense of the two. More layers, more distortion. But it's a grouper album, so it's not oppressive. But it is dense. The title track to the second disc has the most audible lyrics on the record. The song seems to equate feelings of unfamiliarity and unease with being extraterrestrial or alien. The pipe dream I have in the back of my mind is one that involves me moving out of the city and into the secluded mountains of rural Switzerland so I can live out my days reenacting scenes from the popular anime, Heidi. In other words, I want isolation and seclusion. It's so easy to attribute those feelings to introversion or nerdiness, but it's something different. It's feeling alien, uncomfortable. According to the bit of research I've done, a lot of Grouper's traits find inspiration in Harris's childhood. Even the name Grouper points back to her upbringing. In interviews, she mentions being raised in a tight-knit community of people who closely followed the philosophy and teachings of a spiritualist called George Gurdjieff. The community called themselves the group and each other Groupers. The cover to Dragging is a photo of childhood Harris and the album A Man Who Died In His Boat is a reference both in name and lyrical content to a childhood memory. That same colony also adopted a parental philosophy that involved moving children from house to house, family to family. A practice that may or may not have informed the detached, isolated feelings that permeate much of group of music. I I guess it would be fair to say that Liz Harris writes music for loners, for outsiders. What can't be said with any certainty is that Liz Harris herself is a loner or an outsider. While I think there are probably a myriad of interviews featuring Harris floating around the internet, and while some of them may be more personal and revelatory than others, the honest truth is that it really doesn't matter who or what Harris is. I think there's a valuable distinction that can be made between the artist and the art, between the finished product that comes out at the end and the person who works the machine. Are the two connected? Hell yes. But are they always equivocal? No. This is music you listen to alone, and 
that's exactly how I perceive it. Disembodied songs with watery instrumentation and hollow faraway voices. Meditative music that seems to swallow you in. Music that feels deeply personal and therefore so deeply affecting that it's hard to equate the experiences of one listener to that of another. I think the tendency we have as listeners and consumers of media is to search for threads of connection between ourselves and the artist. The well-known dictum of don't meet your heroes speaks to this. What it actually means is that our perception of who an artist is may differ wildly from who they actually are. Particularly because we view them through the lens of their work. Skipping over the discussion on parasocial relationships, I'll, I'll say this. I think that Liz Harris's music, in my mind, is as detached from Harris as it is from itself. I cringe every time I see comments like, Liz Harris is so sad and she's a lost soul, I just want to give her a hug. Not because they're inherently cringeworthy, I think most of them are meant sincerely, but because they seem to ignore the obvious. Maybe the reason that Liz Harris appears sad, isolated, alone, or even happy in her music is because you're sad, isolated, alone, or even happy. It's called projection, and that's way more interesting. The second track off of The Man Who Died In His Boat, Vital, features a wall of vocals each gently cascading over the other to create the sense of disorientation and haze, held together and shaped only by the string picking beneath. It's a dense song that sounds Gregorian at points and dream poppy at others. Since Harris doesn't publish lyrics, it's often unclear exactly what she's singing. There are usually vague hints though, vagaries that are often purely emotional. The same intense chanting vocals appear on the song Being Her Shadow. Her voice occupies most of the atmosphere while indefinite melodies permeate the rest of the space. In general, the man who died in his boat is heavy. It's nearly suffocating in its intensity. There's a real sense of sonic claustrophobia that inhabits most of these songs. More than ever before, her music surrounds and entraps and entrances the listener with well-crafted hooks and enduring melodies. Her words are less defined, smothered by reverberation. And while the music appears altogether shy, at the same time though, it's also totally verbose. There is one moment though where Harris strips away most of the ambience and noise, and we hear her clearer than ever. The song that ends the album, Living Room, is uncharacteristically naked. I can't say for sure what exactly Harris is singing about, but I've been to enough social gatherings to recognize the allusions to awkward behavior that ties some attempts at fitting in, or the seemingly fruitless ordeal that is engaging with strangers. Sonically though, it's a fitting end to an album that can, at times, feel overwhelmingly dense. Ruins is a unique record for so many reasons. Recorded in a house located somewhere in the cliffs of Algezur, Portugal, with nothing but a four-track and a piano, it somehow displays more of Harris than one would expect. The reverb is toned down, giving way to the natural resonance of her surroundings. It's a far cry from dragging a dead deer, but it's no less potent. And even though the lyrics are still buried and hidden, they're still affecting. The second song of the album, Clearing, sees Harris singing along to a piano melody. 
Her words fall on the beats of keys and are often obscured by the piano's thuds. I can make out enough to make it clear that the song deals with love, unrequainted and unresolved. There's one line in particular that stands out to me, and it's a line I've thought and said so many times before in a dozen or so permutations. Even now, saying this, it's kind of hard to explain. The line may seem overwrought and maybe a bit on the emo side, but it is something I relate to. What she's talking about isn't necessarily the same thing as being introverted or wanting to spend time alone. She's talking specifically within the confines of a romantic relationship. There's an irony to the statement that you feel better by yourself even though you're into someone else. And maybe it springs from some other disconnect with the world and the people around you or just from fear. Whatever the reason may be, it's not something that's particularly easy to explain to somebody who doesn't feel the same way. The third song on this record, Call Across Rooms, is a legitimate piano ballad, which is something that is mind-boggling coming from Grouper, because it's different from what she's done up until this point. Partly because of the piano, but more because of the chord progression. It's distractingly normal. So normal it could easily be mistaken for a cover of some other early 2000s heartbreak ballad. And maybe that's a further reflection of this album's nature. Liz Harris letting more of the outside world in. The natural environment creeps into almost every song. A microwave beep sings through the last few seconds of the song Labyrinth and frogs croak along to the spinning piano on the song Lighthouse. Her music has always had a discernible appreciation for wildlife, but this time around, it's not Harris mythologizing them on a song like Fishing Bird. Here they speak for themselves. The natural acoustics of her surroundings have a lot more effect here than they did on her previous albums. The house lends a warmth and a natural dampness to a lot of the songs, and Harris lets it be. There are very few layers to these songs. Although Harris still sings in a trademark whispered tone, her words bleed through a lot clearer than before. Take for example the song Holding. There's a lot to unpack about a song like this, but I won't go into too much detail. The poetry is superb. She makes this comparison between nature and human connection. The desire for stability and longevity shown against nature's irreverent attitude towards failure and collapse. She sings, It's in the morning that the sadness comes, the tears fall down in patterns on the windows, and our shape is undone. You only wanted holding, and I let my structure fail you. And later, in the evening when the moonlight comes, illuminating silver in the rivers as they fall to the sea. The beauty in their failure as the tides erase their lining. This obsession with symmetry and structure and the way nature seems to ignore all of that. Almost rejoicing in the unevenness and non-repeating patterns. We create order within the chaos by arranging things into neat little rows and evenly spaced patterns. Nature does the same thing, but its patterns are often so complex they appear crooked. And we hold that against it. People are messy and more often than not, asymmetrical. Be that emotionally or even psychologically. We are fundamentally flawed. And yet we lose our shit every time things don't stick to our little rules and our little lines that we carve out for them. The river carves a jagged, splintered passage through the valley and Mother Nature shrugs. My mother picks me up a few minutes late and I spend the car ride inexplicably upset. That's not necessarily perhaps what Liz Harris was trying to communicate, but that's what I got. The track list does actually include a little nod to symmetry though. It starts with a song made of metal and ends with a song made of air. 
and the first letters of the songs form a little pattern of M C C L L H H M, which is most likely just Harris having a bit of fun on her end. But if you've ever seen any of her visual work, a lot of it is based on symmetry and patterns, so this is not too far off. The album closes with an 11-minute sound piece. The keyboards and layers return, and the vocals retreat until only the whispers of her voice remain. I'll preface this part of the video by quoting from the press release issued before the release of this album. Grid of Points is a set of songs for piano and voice. I wrote these songs over a week and a half. They stopped abruptly when I was interrupted by a high fever. Though brief, it is complete. The intimacy and abbreviation of this music alludes to an essence that the song's lyrics speak more directly of. The space left after Matt has departed, the stage after the characters have gone, the hollow of some central column, missing. In many ways, Grid of Points continues where Ruins left off. As with Ruins, Grid is sparse and minimal, but still intimate. It's also quite short, coming in at just about 20 minutes. Due to how brief and sparse this album is, it actually forced me to acknowledge the fact that the thing that I like about Grouper most of all are her vocals. It's all that really matters, it's why the self-titled release leaves me wanting. And though this album is a lot like Ruins, it goes one step further. Ruins was bare bones, but Grid of Points is colder, drier, with a minimal amount of reverb. To call this song to piano and voice is a teensy bit inaccurate. These are songs for piano and voices. Her voices, layers upon layers, sheets of whispers. I've compared the quality of her singing to Gregorian chants before, and the opening song, The Races, is perhaps the purest demonstration of that quality. Her vocals are unaccompanied. It's a quiet tune for one person, and it's a song that I wish went on forever. Because of this album's brevity and the consistent instrumentation, these songs have a tendency to breeze by. They're sort of done before you know it, but each one is, nonetheless, distinct. A common criticism that gets thrown at Grouper's music is that it's boring, homogenous, and that it all sounds the same. And those are completely fair criticisms. This is music that requires a bit more from the listener. It's stuff you really want to immerse yourself in and focus on. And I get it, not everybody has the time or the patience for that. But with a little patience and a good ear, it won't be hard to distinguish between songs and furthermore, albums. Each of her albums has a unique sound. Compare a song like Thanksgiving from this album to a song like Heavy Water or Living Room and you'll be surprised at just how different each one is, be that in timbre, tone or composition. But as I've mentioned a few times already, her voice is the only consistent part. But even here on Grid of Points, her voice seems older, deeper. A tone that captures the somberness of this album so well. I actually think Grid of Points may be my favorite grouper album. Dream Loss comes close, but this album communicates a quiet devastation. One that isn't necessarily sad or unwanted. I don't think I've ever really considered any grouper song to be sad. There's also none that I would consider altogether happy either. Because it's somewhere in between. There's a vagueness to it. In a weird way, it's unemotional. It's difficult to tag any of this with any definable feeling. It's like it's all there, all at once. Songs that sound beautiful, sad, happy, indifferent, and overwhelming at the same time. And that works for me. I'm not one for large, dramatic displays of emotion, 
which isn't to say that I don't occasionally enjoy dramatic music, but this is music that pairs with my mood 80% of the time. It's the score that plays between the action scenes, the sound that buzzes around my head when nothing else is happening. And there's not much I can say to persuade anybody that Grouper is a great musician, because that connection I feel with the music is personal. However, if any of this sounds interesting or even halfway relatable, then maybe give it a spin.